Hey everyone, welcome back to PS Platypus. Today we're going to be having a look at some quick anatomy, talking about the brainstem and the cranial nerve nuclei. We would have covered a bit about the brainstem already in a separate video, but we're going to be quickly covering some of the important aspects for you to know for your exam, and mainly talking about why it's important in the context of brainstem stroke syndromes. Let's get started. In terms of content we're going to be covering today, it's going to be the external function of the brainstem, sort of like surface anatomy of the brainstem, if we were to look at um, a uh, specimen of it, and then also talking about the cranial nerves, how they emerge from the brainstem, and also how they originate within the brainstem with the nuclei. And then at the end, we'll have a quick slide on the internal features, just for you to have a look at in your own time, not too important. The main thing, though, clinically is brainstem stroke syndrome, so understanding how stroking different parts of the brainstem affects the different cranial nerve nuclei and also other tracts as well. And it can get quite confusing, so I think the rule of fours is a very handy little uh, trick to have up your sleeve to be able to um, quickly understand how stroking a particular part of the brainstem affects the relevant cranial nerve nuclei and therefore figuring out how the patient would present and vice versa. You also have the visual pathway, but we've already covered that in some detail with the eye anatomy video. So have a look at that if you'd like um, and feel free to ask any questions in the comments. So in terms of anatomy of the brainstem, we only care about the three parts of the brainstem, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. That's all we care about, right? The midbrain is a mesencephalon structure embryologically. The pons and the medulla are both hindbrain structures that are um, derived from the rhombencephalon embryologically. And you can see them um, from superior to inferior on the images all on the right there. So midbrain up top, then the pons and the medulla. Now, in terms of the relations, you can see how the cerebrum connects to the midbrain, the topmost part, and it sort of surrounds the brainstem as well. Again, the cerebrum being sort of the main part of the brain with all the somatosensory cortexes, the motor cortexes and the lobes, it connects to the brainstem superiorly over here, right, with um, the hypothalamus. The cerebellum is connected to the brainstem as well, but posteriorly. So you can see how posterior to the pons, you have the cerebellum, and then in between the two, which is kind of hard to appreciate here, um, but which we'll learn about later on, is the fourth ventricle. So it's sandwiched between the pons and the medulla. That's all you have to really know there. And then with your cranial nerves, you also have um, sort of to look at how they emerge from the brainstem. And one thing to quickly cover before that as well is if you have a look at the brainstem in a bit more detail, one structure which you have to sort of keep in mind is besides sort of the midbrain, pons, and the medulla, they also have their own substructures within them. But an important I want to keep in mind the sulcus limitans. We're going to have a look at that later on, but it's a really important structure for understanding how the cranial nerve nuclei are oriented. But we don't have to worry about that too much for now. And another important structure, sorry, it's over here, sulcus limitans, um, right there. But uh, another important structure is the um, olives of the medulla. So the pyramids you can see medially, but the olives lie more laterally, and they're going to be important uh, relationally in the next slide. So let's have a look at that. So the cranial nerves themselves, right? the 12 cranial nerves emerge from the brainstem or originate or emerge from the brainstem with some exceptions. The exceptions are, first of all, cranial nerve one and two. They lie well above the brainstem and they emerge from sort of the main part of the brain of the cerebrum and sort of extensions of that part of the brain. So the olfactory and optic nerve, cranial nerves one and two are that. However, cranial nerve four is when we start to see it emerging from, cranial nerve three and four is where we start to see it emerge from the brainstem. Cranial nerve four is a tricky one because instead of emerging anterior like most of the other ones, it'll actually emerge posteriorly. So if you have a look back at the diagram here, this is cranial nerve four. It emerges from the midbrain pretty much posteriorly. Then it um, exits anteriorly from the midbrain, right? You can see it sort of wraps around the posterior aspect and comes out anteriorly. Same thing on this diagram here. It's not labeled, unfortunately, on this diagram, but this is cranial nerve or trochlear nerve um, emerging posteriorly and then emerging anteriorly. So it's wrapping around, right? You can see it here as well, trochlear nerve. At the midbrain ponting junction, you have your cranial nerve three, which is, again, very nice and easy to see because anterior, you don't have to worry about the posterior stuff anymore. Anteriorly, it emerges cranial nerve um, three ocular motor nerve. And cranial nerve five, um, is going to be splat bang in the, the pons. It's going to emerge from that transgeminal nerve there. Pontomedullary junction wise, that's going to be the cranial nerves six, seven, and eight. And the great thing about that is that they all emerge sort of medial to lateral. So you can see how cranial nerves six, seven, eight, they emerge medial to lateral in that order, six, seven, eight. Um, at the medulla, we have the rest of them. And it's sort of incorrect here, but anterior to the olives, so anterior to this thing, remember, is cranial nerve 12, so hypoglossal, and posterior to the olive is cranial nerves nine, 10, 11. You can sort of appreciate that there as well. So that's how all the cranial nerves emerge. You're probably wondering why I have to learn all of that and how it's how we're going to possibly uh, memorize all of it or keep it in our heads for 
uh, the exams. Well, we'll actually come to the rule of fours later on, which is a very nice way of remembering everything here. But like understanding sort of how they um, originate and emerge is going to be important um, for your anatomy. So the cranial nerve nuclei are the, the nucleus for the cranial nerves themselves. They're located within the brainstem. So the, the nerves run out of the brainstem, but the nuclei are the origins that are located within the brainstem itself. And they have different vertical and horizontal arrangements. So vertically, you can notice that superior to inferior, the cranial nerve nuclei, generally speaking, occupy different levels. The images here are quite complex. You don't have to worry about them too much. But what you can appreciate, though, with these images is that they're emerging at if, or sort of lying within different levels. So for example, cranial nerve three is like the edinger westphal nucleus uh, as well, is located sort of higher up, whereas a hypoglossal nucleus is located lower down. And also for example, trigeminal nuclei sort of occupies different levels. So you can see the sort of variation. We don't need to worry about which nerve is doing what. The main thing is that they occupy different levels. Okay, that's all done there. The next thing, however, is a bit more involved and interesting, is the horizontal arrangement from medial to lateral. That is um, relevant here because medial to sulcus limitans or medial to this line here lies all the motor structures. So that's your somatic motor, branchial motor, autonomic motor. So medial to the, this line, which is embryologically important, but it's like a, almost like an imaginary line, um, is it your motor nuclei. Whereas lateral to it is all the sensory nuclei. So you have visceral sensory, somatic sensory, special sensory. And you can see that again on the same image on the right there with the cross section, you can see how medially for the sulcus limitans, this line over there is your motor structures or nuclei and then laterally is your sensory nuclei. So that's the main thing then. Medial, motor, lateral, sensory. Again, easy to remember because medial and motor both start with M. But the three main takeaways here are the cranial nerve nuclei occupy different levels vertically and horizontally medial, um, is all the motor nuclei and lateral as well as sensory nuclei. Three key ideas. Don't worry about the images just yet because we're going to talk about an easier way to memorize and understand this, which is your rule of fours, right? The rule of fours is another way for you to abstract this down into um, sort of a uh, easier to use um, idea that you can quickly use for understanding how different brainstem strokes affect different nuclei and therefore the corresponding symptoms. So the way it works is, again, you know, um, the brainstem has three parts, right? The midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. So we're gonna draw three boxes. The midbrain box, the pons, and the medulla, superior to inferior, easy enough. Inside the box, um, oh, sorry, um, before that, the main thing is that inside the box is gonna lie all of our medial and motor nuclei. And outside the box will be all the lateral sensory nuclei. So inside the box, we're going to put all our medial motor nuclei and outside will be all the lateral sensory nuclei. So think of the outside of the box as sort of being the sulcus limitans line, this sort of lateral boundary, um, the sulcus limitans. And we're going to start working in clusters of four. So, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the next cluster. And then that last cluster will be 9, 10, 11, 12. So three clusters of four. And we're going to put those clusters in the midbrain, pons, and middle. So one, two, three, four will be in the midbrain. 5, 6, 7, 8 in the pons and 10, 11, 9, 10, 11, 12 in the medulla, right? Let's start with that in the midbrain. 1 and 2, uh, 1, 2, and 3, 4 are going to be in the midbrain. The, however, 1 and 2 we're going to ignore. Why? Because remember, optic nerve and olfactory nerve arise way above the brainstem. They're not going to be involved with brainstem strokes because they're sort of almost um, cere cere um, cerebral structures, right? So we're going to ignore them. 3 and 4, however, are going to be medial. Why are they medial? Well, everything which is divisible by 12 or a factor of 12 is going to be medial. So three and four are factors of 12, they're going to be medial, right? Let's move on to the next cluster of four, so five, six, seven, eight in the pons. Let's put that there. Now only six again is medial because that's the only one divisible or a factor of 12. And it's five, seven, eight aren't, they're all sensory, which sort of makes sense. Uh, seven is a bit of an exception because it's um, like motor with facial, but also has some sensory components to it. So we sort of uh, put it laterally because it is located laterally. And you can see as well, um, in this diagram, if you, had, if you were to have a look, seven sensory nuclei is here, and also it's motor nuclei is over here as well. So it's sort of a bit of a gray line there, but we sort of stick it in the lateral part anyways, for the purposes of this simple uh, demonstration. And then finally, 9, 10, 11, 12 is like this, because again, 12 is going to be medial motor, 9, 10, 11, they're not divisible by 12, so they're going to be on the outside, and they're going to be lateral sensory. So again, see if you can construct this on your own and put this together uh, from scratch from on your own um, because that's going to be very useful to be able to use to understand brainstem strokes. How do you use it? Well first of all you don't have to worry about this right image here because it's a bit of a ugly complex image which is hard to memorize whereas the one on the right uh, left here 
is a bit more approachable and one that is actually used by clinicians as well to be able to figure out how certain strokes affect certain parts of the cranial nerves. So let's have a look at that same sort of diagram. Again, you can construct it on your own to see if you can practice using it because it's very important to be able to do that. But we can actually use it to understand how different strokes will affect different parts of your cranial nerves. So the way it works, so let's say, for example, you were to have a left medial midbrain stroke. So it's going to be a medial midbrain stroke. So it's going to be in this inside the box, right? But on the left, so the left of the patient, which is here. Now, because the cranial nerve nuclei and the nerves emerge directly like that, and they don't sort of cross over, the crossing over happens sort of beforehand from the um, cerebrum when it's coming down into the brainstem. We don't have to worry about that, but essentially because they just come out straight ipsilaterally and just do their thing, all the symptoms are gonna be ipsilateral. So if you have a left midbrain medial stroke, you're gonna have left-sided symptoms uh, with, the, uh, with the cranial nerves. So in this case, if you were to have a left medial midbrain stroke, that's going to affect your ocular motor and trochlear nerves. So you're going to have left ocular motor symptoms and left trochlear symptoms with your, your left eye again. So you're going to have a down and out eye, drooping of that eyelid, and um, it'll be dilated and unable to sort of constrict in response to light because of your ocular motor not working. And trochlear, similar thing, because it's not able to control a superior oblique muscle, you're going to have that effect on the, on the left eye, right? Um, whereas if you were to have a right-sided stroke of the exact same thing, so a right-sided medial um, midbrain stroke, you'd have the same things, but on your right eye. So it's ipsilateral effects is the main thing. Uh, similar principle can be applied to the pons as well. Let's say you had a medial, um, medial a right medial um, pon stroke, or we'll just switch it up now. We'll make it a right lateral pon stroke. So like, like sort of in this region. And again, because it's so sort of symmetrical, you'd have cranial nerve nuclei is five, seven, and eight here. So right lateral pons stroke will affect cranial nerves, cranial nerves five, seven, and eight. So five, you have trigeminal nerve. You're going to have sensory loss on the right-hand side of your face because it's a right-hand side, right side of stroke of the brainstem. And you're also going to have the over trigeminal distribution again. And with seven, you're going to have a weakness in your facial uh, muscle um, muscles. So that's you know, um, it's lateral again. And also the same with taste as well, because if you remember quarter tympani is a component of facial nerve, which is responsible for taste with the anterior two thirds of the tongue. And with cranial nerve eight, which is responsible for hearing and balance, it's gonna be a right-sided hearing and balance issue. So all that on the right, because the stroke was on the right, remember, it's lateral effects. And then you can try and have a go at figuring out the same thing for the medial medulla and lateral medulla, uh, because we're actually gonna have a look at that next. However, the reason I'm gonna take a bit of a rendezvous here and sort of have a bit of a step back from this is this is only part of the image. We're, look, we're looking at the cortical bulbar tracks. In other words, the, tra um, the tracks responsible for the cranial nerves um, and their respective uh, end organs and the function. So it's looking at cranial nerves one through 12, but what we're ignoring here that the brainstem is much more than that. It's not just for the um, cranial nerves, it's also a conduit for other tracks. So if you have a look here, the, uh, brain, uh, the brainstem also acts as an important passage for ascending and descending tracks, so sensory and motor tracks, which are the DCML, which is your dorsal column medium meniscus pathway, which is for fine touch and proprioception, and spinal thalamic, which is for pain, and then cortical spinal, which is your motor tract, which is for voluntary movements of your body's skeletal muscles, so sort of like your, your neck and down, right? Whereas um, everything above, your face and uh, the rest of it, is your cortical bulbar tract, which is your cranial nerves. I hope that all sort of makes sense. There's quite a lot of information there, but notice how all these tracks sort of cross over at some point, right? They either cross over in the brainstem or later on. What that means is if you, if you were to have a brainstem stroke, the effects would be on the opposite side. So let's say, for example, you would have a right-sided brainstem stroke. Sorry, it would be here in the medulla, right? A right-sided brainstem stroke. Then notice how, because the nerves cross over after the brainstem, sort of below it, you're going to have um, the DCML being affected on the left because right uh, brainstem stroke affects the left DCML. So contralateral symptoms. Same with the pain one. It looks like it's not crossing over, but if you have a look down at the bottom, it's crossing over. So a right-sided brainstem stroke affects the contralateral side with pain being reduced or um, absent because of the loss of that transmission. And then cortical spinal as well. It crosses over within the brainstem or later on. So I think uh, lateral crosses over within the brainstem, but then anterior cortical spinal um, crosses over below um, at the level. And so either way, 
um, eventually it'll cross over. And so a stroke within the brainstem will have effects or motor weakness on the contralateral side, right? So that's the main thing to keep in mind is that brainstem strokes affect your uh, tracks, these tracks, at least contralaterally, whereas the cranial nerve tracks, they're affected each laterally. Hope that all makes sense. It's the sort of main principle there, which I want to tease out. Now we can use that to understand the medial and lateral medullary syndromes. So the medial medullary syndrome, we can sort of put that into place. It can be a bit confusing because there's quite a few cranial nerve nuclei involved. Some of it won't, won't make too much sense, but I'll sort of try to explain why it's the case. So let's think about the medial medulla being infarcted or stroked out, right? In that case, you're gonna have, again, the medial medulla corresponds to cranial nerve 12. If you have to draw a diagram from the start, we get cranial nerve 12 as being the medial medulla motor uh, nuclei. So you're gonna have impairments of the hypoglossal nerve, which is responsible for tongue movements on your, um, whichever side is affected ipsilaterally. So if we had a right-sided medial medulla stroke, it would be a right-sided weakness. Um, and in terms of the rest of the tracks, so remember the corticospinal tract also passes through the brainstem, but we're going to have contralateral effects. So right-sided brainstem stroke would have left-sided weakness of the arm and leg. Um, and then the DCML, similar idea, you're going to have contralateral loss of vibration and proprioception in the arm and the leg because they pass through here. Um, so, so the main thing here is your motor, corticospinal, passes through medially. And also your medial lemniscus, DCML, passes through medially. The four M's sort of are in the medial area. The lateral medulla, however, contains your sensory nuclei. So that's, you know, you know if you have a look there, 9, 10, and 11. Um, and uh, it also contains, um, if you have a look at the other image, parts of five. So we consider that as well to be here. But with 9, 10, 11, you'd expect sensory um, losses or um, loss of sensory um, signaling from them. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and also laterally, spinal thalamic tract, because that's with S, the four S's lie laterally. So sympathetic, spinal thalamic, spinal cerebellar, and sensory, they all lie laterally. Spinal thalamic is um, going to have contralateral um, reduction in pain temperature um, as well. And sympathetic and spinal cerebellar will have similar things. However, they're going to be ipsilateral effects because, um, again, they're not crossing over at all. It's a bit um, of a lot of information taken, but essentially the main idea here is cranial nerve effects are ipsilateral with brainstem strokes, whereas um, your DCML, corticospinal, and spinal thalamic are all contralateral effects with your brainstem strokes. And also important to keep in mind is medially, you have your motor pathways and the medial lemniscus pathway, which is like an exception kind of because that's sort of a sensory thing, right? The medial lemniscus is an afferent pathway, but it lies medially within the brainstem. And spinal thalamic, however, is contralateral and uh, sorry, it is um, lateral in the brainstem and is responsible for pain and, and therefore part of lateral medullary syndrome. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to comment um, and let us know if you want a bit more of a detailed explanation of that. But that's sort of the main thing to do with brainstem strokes. And then at a higher level, which you have to worry about here, you can actually tie in the vessel that's affected with the symptoms. So for example, maybe if you had a person coming in, they had particular signs and symptoms, you can correlate that, that to the underlying cranial nerve nuclei affected, and then correlate that to the um, corresponding brainstem region affected, and then correlate that to a particular vessel that's gonna be affected. Doesn't really matter too much because eventually you can do imaging to find out which of the vessels is affected, but a useful idea to think about as well. Um, not needed for you at year two. Year two, all you have to do is the stuff beforehand um, and really only just worry about that. And then now we can sort of appreciate the internal features of the brainstem. Um, you know, it's uh, beauty. You can see over here, basically, if you were to take cross sections of the brainstem, you'd be able to see the nuclei at different levels. Um, not too important to know in that much detail, uh, but just a nice little way to tie it all together. Um, and there's some images I've annotated there um, that you can have a look at. So that's all I'm going to leave you with. That's quite a bit of content. And if you do find that confusing, feel free to take a look at the slides and um, DM me if you have any questions or comment down below if you have any questions. And I'll try and get back to you. But otherwise, I'll leave you to it.